Hello everyone, and welcome back to the History of Africa podcast. I'm your host, Andy. Last week, we witnessed the meteoric rise of the Denkira, the first true empire in the history of the force of Ghana. However, by the end of the episode, cracks were beginning to form in the Denkira state, as the vast resources needed to maintain the empire's war machine were beginning to take their toll. Raising the necessary funds to pay for their endless wars in the south required ever more rapacious tactics, resulting in a rising tide of anger and resentment against the empire from its Ashanti subjects. Season 3, Episode 3, The Kingdom of Kumasi. So, before we get into the revolt that would eventually establish the Ashanti Empire, I think it's first important to better establish who the Ashanti are. So, if you remember back to our first episode this season, then you'll recall that the Ashanti, like the Denkira, are a subgroup of the Akan ethnicity. And, like all Akan, both are descendants of Akan settlers who gradually migrated out of the Bono state and into the forested interior throughout the 13th, 14th, and 15th centuries. Now, before we continue, I think it's important that we address a bit of terminology that might prove confusing if it isn't explained. So, when you talk about the history of the Ashanti, or the Akan more generally, or Africa even more generally, it's pretty common to hear people describe the Ashanti, or even sometimes all of the Akan, as a tribe. In fact, many Akan today even describe themselves as a tribe. But this term is ultimately misleading. Now, many, many historians and anthropologists have pointed out how the word tribe is kind of loaded. It brings with it all sorts of implications of rurality and uncivilizedness. And that's true, but ultimately not my objection here. The problem is that, at least according to the most common definitions of the term tribe, the Ashanti, and definitely the Akan as a whole, do not meet the definition. One definitive component of the idea of a tribe is the implication of shared ancestry or familial ties. Now, as I just stated, this is like vaguely true of the Ashanti, as the Ashanti all in some way, shape, or form descend from the Bono state. However, the Akan who migrated out of Bonoman and eventually became the Ashanti did not all come from one family. And the Ashanti don't really share any more shared lineage than any other ethnic group. Like, uh, people don't call the French a tribe even though they all share some lineage to some degree. Therefore, I would argue that the Ashanti are better defined as an ethnic group, or in this case, as an ethnic subgroup. And this is where it gets confusing, because you see, there is a tribal system that exists in the Akan. As in, like, there are large extended families that hold a degree of shared influence through their kinship. Specifically, the Akan, in addition to being divided between different ethnic groups, are also divided among eight tribes, or, in Akan, Abusua. So, I know this is confusing, but let me give an example. One of the eight tribes of the Akan are the Ekuona, an extended family that was, according to oral histories, the first Akan family to migrate southward. Anyways, many other tribes would later break off from them, whether as a result through marriage or from breaking a familial taboo and being expelled from the Abusua as a result. But anyways, belonging to the Ekuona or any other family didn't necessarily align you with a certain ethnic group, right? While most Ekuona today belong to the Fanti ethnic group, some are Ashanti, others are Denkira. So to summarize this confusing system, there are both tribes and ethnic groups within the Akan, and they sometimes overlap, but they're not necessarily the same thing. Tribes are basically large extended families, while ethnic groups describe culture alone, and not necessarily shared ancestry. So why does this matter? Well, as we mentioned in the last episode, during the time of the Denkira's conquest of the Ashanti, the Ashanti were not united into a single kingdom, but were largely ruled by independent city-states. However, rule in these independent city-states was somewhat tribal. Typically, who would rule an Ashanti city-state at this time was determined by who came from the most powerful tribe in the region, that is to say, who had the strongest family connections in town. And it really is appropriate, at least at this time, to think of the Abusua as separate political units. Different tribes of the Ashanti formed alliances against each other, they fought battles and made diplomatic marriages. Different city-states, even those ruled by the same tribal family sometimes, even engaged in similar diplomacy and conflict. In every way that matters, the Ashanti people were ruled by dozens of independent city-states, and the tribal system was sort of like a dynastic system, so to say. Now, of the eight Abasua among the Akan, one called the Oyoko family will prove to be the most important and crucial to the foundation of the Ashanti Empire. The semi-legendary foundation tradition of the Oyoko tribe is an interesting story in and of itself. The Oyoko, like many Akan tribes, claim descent from the Ekuona, 
However, the founders of the Oyoko were kicked out of the Ekuona when they broke a familial taboo. You see, each of the tribes of the Akan are associated with a certain animal, which acts as something of a sacred symbol or totem of the family. For the Ekuona, this symbol was the buffalo, and as a result, the buffalo were regarded as sacred by members of the tribe. However, one member of the tribe was caught eating the meat of a buffalo, violating the tribe's sacred animal. For their crime, they and their family were labeled Oyoko, meaning eaters of buffalo, and expelled from the tribe. Now, this story comes across to me, at least, as pretty folkloric, but it was too interesting not to share. Anyways, over time after their casting out, the Oyoko would gradually grow in size and power to become one of the most important tribes among the Ashanti. This was especially true in Ashante Manso. Ashante Manso, the purported first major settlement of the Akan who would later become the Ashanti, was, in the early 17th century, the largest and most economically significant city in the Ashanti region. The Oyoko became the most influential and significant tribe within Ashante Manso, and due to their control of this important city, the Oyoko would become the preeminent tribe among the Ashanti altogether. In fact, so important were the Oyoko that one of the kings of Ashante Manso, Oti Akanten, even proclaimed himself to be the king of all Ashantis, claiming the title of Ashante Hene. However, it seems like most historians don't take this claim too seriously, and argue that he was still merely a local king who was claiming a bit above what he actually controlled. Yes, he was a powerful local king, and one certainly full of confidence if he was just willing to crown himself Ashantehene, but a local king nonetheless. Akenten's life is not very well documented, but the next king of Oyoko, Akenten's nephew, is. Yes, his nephew, not his son. You see, Akan's succession is matrilineal, meaning that inheritance and family affiliation are passed down not from the father, but from the mother. However, in the case of the succession of royal lineages, things were a little bit different. Rather than the king and queen's son, it would be the king's sister's son, that is, the king's maternal nephew, who would become the next king. There's a lot of speculation about why a Khan inheritance works this way. One common one I've seen is a fear of paternity fraud, that Akan men were afraid of their inheritance being given to a son of their wives who wasn't actually their biological child. However, by giving the role to his biological sister's son, he could guarantee with some level of certainty that the next king would be his biological kin. I've also heard that the matrilineal system originated due to the Akan's origins as settlers in rural territories, and that like in many other rural settler societies, women were given more responsibility and prestige in the family's affairs. Anyways, before he died, Akenten made an important decision which would have wide-reaching implications for later Ashanti history. You see, each Ashanti king in his court had a position of Okomfo, usually translated as fetish priest. The Okomfo was an incredibly important position, essentially doubling as both the religious leader of a city, as well as the king's most important advisor, and sometimes even functioned as an ambassador or diplomat. And, when the last Okomfo died, Akenten made the decision to appoint a man named Anokye as the new Okomfo, before he himself followed the old Okomfo into the afterlife a few years later. Now, Anokye is an interesting figure. He was presumably fairly young when he was appointed, as he's going to be around in our story for a while, and he will also play a critical role in the foundation of the Ashanti Empire. Despite this, however, he actually wasn't Ashanti. Rather, Anokye was from the neighboring Akwamu ethnic group, but happened to come from a tribe that had some deep connections in both the Ashanti city-states as well as the Akamu kingdom. Remember how I said that tribal families in the Akan often transcended ethnic groups? In fact, some sources even claim that Anyoke had some sort of familial connection to the Oyoko, and that's what allowed him to land this prestigious job as a Komfo in the city of Ashante Manso. Others claim that Anyoke, still a young man at this point, demonstrated such skill and prowess during religious ceremonies in Akwamu that he became a minor celebrity, and that Akenten went out of his way to lure Anokye to work as his fetish priest. Regardless as to why he came to Ashante Manso, however, Anokye would prove to be the perfect pick for the job, as he would leave his mark not only on religious practice of the Ashanti, but would also play a pivotal role in more secular matters of statecraft as well. When the new king of Ashante Manso, a man named Obiri Yaboa, came to the throne, he kept Anokye around as his fetish priest, a decision which would prove to define his rule. 
supposedly due to the advice of a group of oracles. Anokia believed that the Oyoko needed to move away from their capital at Ashante Manso and establish a new capital elsewhere. Why scholars think that Anokia wanted to establish a new capital is heavily debated. From what I've read, historians tend to either say that the decision to move the capital was due to overcrowding in Ashante Manso, or to try to get further away from the Denkira capital at Abanque Seso, either of which sounds plausible to me, and it might be a combination of the two. Regardless of why, Anokie sought to find a region with the most fertile soil, as this would be the best location for a new capital. According to legend, he planted three kum trees, each in a different location, figuring that the site with the best soil would produce the tallest, healthiest tree. In the end, the soil outside the small village of Kwaman produced the most impressive tree, so Anokie advised the king to move his seat of power to the new location. The new royal capital at Kwaman was named Kumasi, meaning city under the kum tree. And with the most influential member of the Oyoko clan moving his capital to a new northern location, the formerly small village began to rapidly swell into a respectably sized town. However, Obiri Yeboa would not live long to enjoy the new growth of his capital. Only a few years after he made his decision to move the capital to Kumasi, war broke out with the Dorma, another neighboring Akan ethnic group to the west. The Dorma went unmentioned during our first episode, largely due to their later emergence from other Akan groups. The Dorma originate not from settlers from the Bono state, but rather from a succession dispute within the Aquamu kingdom, in which two brothers feuded over the throne. When one of them lost, he stormed out of Aquamu with a group of supporters and established his own kingdom far to the west, which would eventually become Dorma. However, far to the west of Aquamu meant right to the west of the Ashanti cities, including the newly established Kumasi. And in 1694, the Dorma invaded, eventually making it to the edge of Kumasi itself. The Denkira were far too busy with their wars near the coast, and were therefore unwilling to protect their tributaries against the Dorma. And besides, the Dorma were even sort of Denkira tributaries as well. Sure, they paid significantly less tribute than the Ashanti, but they did send the occasional tribute payment of their own to the Denkira Hene. So why would the Denkira care about one tributary fighting another? So, the burden of fighting off the invading Dorma fell on the Ashanti themselves. As the most powerful of the local Ashanti leaders, Yeboa managed to negotiate a temporary alliance between Kumasi and some other Ashanti states, including the nearby cities of Juaben and Bekwai, as well as Mampong, the second most powerful Ashanti city-state at the time. The rulers of these city-states, while still independent, recognize the threat presented by the Dorma and understand that if Kumasi fell, they would be next. However, unlike the Denkira and other coastal peoples, the Ashanti at this time still presumably fought wars in the old traditional Akan manner. Swords and bows in hand, the warriors of the nobility, and some peasant conscripts of the various Akan tribes joined together on the battlefield under Yeboah's leadership. At the ensuing battle, Yeboah managed to score a slight victory over the invaders, stopping them from taking Kumasi, but at a great cost. Depending on which account you believe, Yeboah was either killed outright during the battle, or was gravely injured and then returned to Kumasi where he died of his wounds a few days after. With Yeboah's unexpected death, rule over Kumasi and the Oyoko more generally fell into the hands of his 35-year-old nephew, Ose Tutu, in 1695. Now, Ose Tutu is a pretty big name in Ashanti history. He will eventually go down in history as maybe the single most important and transfigurative figure in the history of the Ashanti, but for now, he's merely the heir to a small city-state subject to the Denkira Empire. And not only that, but his position as King of Kumasi was far from secure when he took the throne. So how did Ose Tutu, who would eventually become the greatest king of the Ashanti, emerge from this tenuous circumstance? As the son of the king's sister, Ose Tutu was, from the beginning, the most likely candidate as the next king of Kumasi. This position as heir afforded the young Ose several advantages, not only the obvious material privileges that come with being a prince, but also in terms of less tangible political benefits. One of these benefits was, as the heir apparent, the ability to develop a close relationship not only with his uncle, but also with other important figures within Kumasi's government, namely the Okonfo Anokie. However, the prestige that came with being an important royal prince also brought with it some drawbacks. Namely, like many empires of its era, the Denkira had a policy of taking the heirs of their subject kingdoms as hostages to enforce their control. After all, if any Ashanti kings tried anything funny, the Denkira could always just threaten to kill their captive heir, affording considerable leverage in negotiations. So, 
When Ose Tutu became an adult, traditionally marked among the Akan at the age of 16, a representative of the Denkirahene rode into Kumasi and demanded that the teenage prince come with him. There, he was taken to the Denkira capital of Abanke Seso. Now, while terms like hostage and prisoner might invoke images of cold dungeons and steel cages, this was not usually the case with prestigious political prisoners like the young Ose Tutu. Rather, it's better to think of it as being under house arrest, but in someone else's house. Ose Tutu lived in the Denkirahene's estate as basically an honored guest. After all, he was here for diplomatic leverage, and it would do nothing but provoke resentment if Ose Tutu and other Ashanti princes were treated poorly. Remember, these guys are presumably the future kings of Ashanti city-states, so the Denkirahene does want to get these guys to like him. Ose Tutu's days were spent socializing with the elites of Abanke Seso, eating lavish meals, and playing Awari, a traditional Akan strategy game similar to Mankala. But at the end of the day though, he was a prisoner, so leaving the estate was strictly prohibited. He also took up a pastime that would land him in a fair amount of trouble. That is, getting familiar with the ladies of the Denkirahene's estate, including his daughter. It's not especially clear if this took the form of a secret committed relationship, or if the young Oyoko prince was just a ladies man. But at some point, Ose Tutu slept with the Denkirahene's daughter during her visit to the palace. And, like so many love affairs in this era before modern forms of birth control, she got pregnant. So, Ose Tutu, understandably, started freaking out. I mean, what would happen to him if the Denkirahene's grandchild popped out looking a little bit too similar to a certain Oyoko hostage? So, he booked it and escaped back to Kumasi. Now, whether the Denkira were immediately aware of his motives for fleeing is unclear. But obviously, Ose Tutu was a fleeing hostage, so the Denkira pursued him. Ose Tutu knew that he couldn't stay in Kumasi. Remember, the Oyoko still were subjects of the Denkira Hane, so Denkira soldiers could just swoop into Kumasi any day and capture him. So, during his brief return to Kumasi, Ose turned to his old friend Anokie for advice. Anokie, who remember, was originally from the Akwamu Kingdom, advised Ose Tutu to flee to their capital of Akwamufi. The Akwamu, as enemies of both the Dorma and to a lesser extent the Denkira, would surely be willing to protect the Ashanti prince. Not to mention, the current Akwamu Hene was a friend of his, and would surely provide the young prince with shelter if Anokie asked nicely. So, with this advice, Ose Tutu made a beeline for Akwamufi, safely arriving in the city shortly after. Now, the kingdom to which Ose Tutu fled, the Akwamu, is an interesting state in its own right. Like most Akans, the Akwamu originated from settlers who left the Bono state, and represent the furthest eastward migration of the Akan. The Akwamu, in fact, settled their capital, Akwamufi, east of the Volta River, typically seen as the borderland between Akan and other people's territories. The Akwamu, in terms of government, were much more like the Denkira than the Ashanti. Rulership in Akwamu territories was not divided between clans and cities, but was united under the rule of the Akwamu Hene. This unity, combined with an incredibly professionalized and bureaucratized military system, which we'll touch on in more detail next episode, allowed the Akwamu to expand their influence immensely. The Akwamu expanded in all directions, seizing cities like Peki to the north and Larta to the east, while enforcing a tributary status on the scattered villages to the west and the Ga cities to the south. Meanwhile, the complex bureaucratic system in Akwamu which divided Aquamu territories in a strategic manner to ensure bureaucratic efficiency, ensured that all these newly conquered territories could produce the benefits that came with conquest in full. In effect, Aquamu was the only state in Ghana at the time that could equal the Denkira's ability to expand their influence. And unlike the Denkira, they weren't engaged in an almost century-long period of intermittent warfare with their neighbors. So, the chances of the Denkira just entering Akwamu territory to snatch up the fugitive Ose Tutu were essentially non-existent. However, while the Akwamu Hene proved to be a kind and generous host to Ose Tutu, Ose's plans were never to stay in Akwamu for long. When he heard about his uncle's death at the hands of the Dorma, he knew that this was his time to return to Kumasi and establish himself as the new Kumasi Hene. With a small vanguard of Akwamu mercenaries as protection, Ose Tutu returned to Kumasi. His plan? Repel the invading Dorma for good, then end the Ashanti status as tributaries of Denkira. However, in order to do so, he knew that the various Ashanti clans and cities would have to unite, 
And while the Dormas invasion and the ever-rising Denkira taxes to fund their wars provided a motive, there had to be a central figure for them to unite behind. So, when Ose Tutu made his triumphant return to Kumasi, he entitled himself not as King of Kumasi, but as Ashante Hane, King of all Ashantis. And, unlike the previous kings of Kumasi, Ose Tutu would prove that this title was not merely a proclamation on paper, but would soon become a material reality. Join us for our next episode, when Ose Tutu builds an army ready for war with the Denkira. Thank you for listening to the History of Africa podcast. If you like the show and the free education we provide, then I'd encourage you to support the show. This can be done by a monetary donation to our Patreon, which can be found on our website, historyofafricapodcast.blogspot.com by giving the show a review on iTunes or by sharing the podcast to anyone who you think might be interested. This episode, like all others, is brought to you by our patrons. Raul Kanakia, Ayo Fagbamie, Aaron L., and Kevin Johnson, among others. Thank you for helping to make the show happen.